of a wonderful job that they've done tonight. I also want to uh, to say um, it's just wonderful to be back here. Uh, I wanted to mention, I, I really couldn't go on with this without saying that um, this book is dedicated to a Berkeley professor who was a very special friend to my <coughs> memory of Reginald E. Zelnick, who I co-edited a book with on the free speech movement, and my plan was to kind of hijack him from his Russian history work to uh, have him help on this book, because he knew Mario very well and knew the free speech movement, you know, superbly. And I just want to say, uh, 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 Penn and, and Elaine Zelnick are here tonight, I want your presence. And, uh, um, uh, to uh, just say that uh, I, I think that um, uh, that what Reggie also did on the faculty um, um, in supporting the free speech movement and standing up for freedom, and some of the faculty uh, uh, who were involved in that are here tonight. I see Charles Sellers and Leon Wafsi and Charles Muscatine uh, and Leon, of course, you've seen, and uh, there are others that I missed. And oh, and Larry Levine too. Uh, Larry uh, participated in the session. Um, uh, that we did uh, with Leon at the OEH on, um, on Mario that was really instrumental in, uh, in, uh, in making this book possible. Some of the most insightful quotes in the book come from uh, the people I've named, including Larry, and I just want to say that uh, if it takes a, a village to, to raise a person, it's clearly what you might say, it takes a kind of community to be able to put out a book about a movement like this. And so I'm grateful to all of, all of those who, who um, who uh, helped me and inspired me to do this. So I just want to start by saying that. Um, a few other things. Um, uh, just to, what I thought I would do, I want to keep this fairly brief so this time for a discussion. Um, I also want to say that the reason I arranged this as I did, I want this to be a kind of cross-generational uh, uh, panel that would relate uh, the free speech movement and Mario Salvia's uh, life to today. Because I think there are relationships. And the history that we're dealing with here is not a museum piece. It's something that raises a lot of issues that are ongoing for us in the university and beyond. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. The, the way in which the university uh, is, I think, still challenged and still um, has a, lot, a long way to go to kind of fulfill some of Mario's. And also, Mario, I want to say, uh, this is a movement that is hyper-democratic, not just democratic. Mario called it hyper-democratic. And um, it's always like, you know, if there's a real ambivalence about the very idea of leadership because the SNCC political style was, you don't need leaders. If you have a movement, it, should, it will generate its own leaders. So you don't need celebrities. You need grassroots leaders, and they can keep coming. So when I talk about Mario and a lot of these issues, you know, he's very distinctive and you know, just a, a, a very, very, his great qualities as an orator and a leader that are, that are, are you know, in some ways are replaceable. But on the other hand, I think he'd be the first to say that the movement uh, was responsible for the way that he he, he rose to leadership and not the other way around. It was not a movement made by leaders. And so actually, and for all his life, he's very ambivalent about the idea of leadership. So and I think there's something in an era in which people are always pursuing power, you know, where leaders are pursuing power, to have somebody who's really not interested in personal power is, is quite uh, impressive. And I think it's, it's sort of representative of, his, uh, of the movement itself. So anyway, what I want to talk about is some of these issues about what the implications of Mario's life are for higher education and for the University of California in particular. Um, and I, I'll break this down. I was going to read from the book, but uh, to save time, I'll probably just do it uh, with a minimum of quotes. But it's all in there and, uh, uh, if you have the time to read it. First thing is, he, I think his vision is basically democratic, strongly democratic about the university. It is the, the free speech movement began in part because rather than welcoming back to school, you know, in the fall of 64, those who had risked their lives in the South and those working in the Bay Area Civil Rights Movement, the university responded by clamping down and banning political advocacy from the Bancroft, uh, the, uh, Bancroft Telegraph Strip. So um, the idea here was, I think for Mario, he felt, and he wasn't alone again, taking him as representative of his generation here, he felt that the university should be a place where uh, the, the university should not just serve the elite, it's just not, not to serve corporations and not to serve some, uh, some, some, uh, some research functions, which he you know, thought were important as well, but should also be there to help those at the bottom of society, to help become an instrument for social change and for social progress in that way. And so I think he saw the uh, civil rights movement very much in that context and felt that it was outrageous that after risking his life in the South and actually getting beaten up by the Klan, and endangering black people there who, and this is one thing you have to understand about Mario, that 
the most memorable thing for him from that summer in Mississippi was not that he had been beaten up by the Ku Klux Klan, but rather that he had seen the courage of ordinary black people in Mississippi who stood up and risked their lives to get the vote. At a time when going downtown to register to vote meant going to a, uh, a segregationist courthouse with officials who did not want you to register. And the most searing memory he had was one of the African Americans who he took to register to vote. Um, and you could not go in the door. You could stay and stay in the doorway, but they had to go and register themselves. And this was an elderly African American farmer in his 60s or 70s. And uh, he comes in and uh, he, uh, he wants to register. So the, the uh, registrar, who was the sheriff's wife, who was very bold, him, says, what do you want, boy? And he was a 60, 67 year old African American, uh, not, a, not, a, not a young boy. That was obviously the meaning. Um, he said, I want a radish man. And that's the way that a, a black farmer is pronounced register. They made it to a two-syllable word, radish. He said, what do you mean radish, boy? We don't got no radishes here. And she knew what he wanted to do. He said, I want a radish man. And it went back and forth. And Mario felt like, you know, she tried to humiliate him. And Mario was standing in the, in the doorway. He's not allowed to come in. And he felt like he said, you know, I, it was just so excruciating to see this. But it was also inspiring that here was an African-American farmer who was risking getting evicted from his property, perhaps risking his life and being insulted because of something that he, Mario, had done. And so he said, in that moment, I became an adult. And I knew that this was a struggle, and I knew where I stood in the struggle. So when he came back to Berkeley in the fall, and the administration was trying to bar uh, political accuracy on campus, you see, he had ended up in Mississippi, as I said earlier, after going to the Sharon Palace and, and learning about it in jail, right? But the, how did he get to the Sharon Palace? It was through a, a leaflet on, on, on the bankrupt strip, you see? So for him, this wasn't an academic thing. It was like outrageous that in the free part, and this is almost like Civil War era language, in the free part of the country, it was outrageous that the university was aligning itself with the segregationists established in Mississippi. That's how he saw it. And he thought this was really an abomination. And he never had a doubt for a moment that he was going to stand up and defy this. And he was not alone. It wasn't like, am I going to defy this? It's how are we going to stop this? How are we going to get our rights back? So right away, there's this idea of connecting the university to serving the larger society and those at the bottom of society. So that's one piece of it. Another has to do, I think, with the vision for the university itself. And this evolved over time. The people involved in the free speech movement did not initially see themselves as educational reformers. They were trying to help change society more broadly, at least the civil rights activists were. But what happened in the course of the struggle, they realized that there was something you know, amiss with the university and the way it was functioning. Where did these new regulations come from? Who was consulted about it? You know, it was not something the students were consulted about, nor were the faculty. It was ordered unilaterally by the administration. And so the idea was that the nature of the university had to be changed so that students and faculty and Mario thought of, when he thought of the university, he thought of it as the students and the faculty. His view of the administration was well, administration should keep the buildings lit and the sidewalks clean. Educational policy should be set by the faculty and students, the community, the teachers, and learners. That was Mario's perspective. But let me just, I just want to run through real briefly an episode, there are a lot of episodes, dramatic episodes in the, uh, in the free speech movement that you could, you could point to as really emblematic or that, to bring out these issues. I think that, you know, it's a close call, which is the most uh, dramatic and the most striking. There's a lot, it's a police car, the mass sit-in. I think the Greek theater episode yeah. is really very, very symptomatic of that. And by the way, this is why I'm wearing a tie tonight, so I'll tell you a bit about this. Uh, um, what, 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 what happened with the Greek theater was this. After the mass arrest at Sproul Hall, uh, Clark Kerr, the president of the university, was trying to find a way to kind of get back the initiative and find a way to, to, uh, to, to push back against this, uh, this cause of, of no restriction of political advocacy on campus. So he tried with the department chairman, and they weren't chairmen back then, to, uh, to impose a, what he saw as a compromise settlement. I won't go into the details of it. It wasn't a compromise settlement that really uh, did anything except compromise the, the, uh, the free speech goals of the free speech movement. <laughs> but in any case, he was going to, and it's interesting, you know, people talk about the student strike, 
right? There was a student strike. But you know, in other words, the willingness to suspend classes for your cause. But this was Clark Curtis' strike. That is, he was suspending classes for that morning to go up to the Greek theater to give his, to try to have his settlement imposed, right? It's kind of interesting. Um, and uh, so anyway, the, the thing about this meeting and this attempt to impose a settlement was, it was this is after there have been a semester of protests, the largest mass arrest in American history, the largest demonstrations on a college, on a university campus in American history, right? Enormous conflict. He's going to impose a settlement and announce it at this meeting, right? Without any students speaking, right? Just think about what that says. And Mario, uh, and he wasn't alone, he went up and he said to Clark, he met with Clark and said, look, you know, this doesn't seem fair. How can we have a meeting and not allow somebody from the free speech movement to speak? And uh, President Kerr's response was bureaucratic. No big surprise. He basically said, look, it's, a, it's not a meeting that I control. It's controlled by the faculty. It's a faculty chairman's meeting. And Mario said, well, I knew that was true only in a narrow technical sense. Because obviously the meeting was, was confirmed by, was convened by Kerr. So what happens is, he says, well, you'll have to see Professor Scalapino, who was the chairman of the Council of Chairmen. And so Mario says, okay. He goes to Scalapino, and he says, look, he says the same thing. We need to speak at this meeting. It concerns our rights. And Scalapino says, um, uh, no, this is a structured meeting. It's a faculty meeting. It was not be right for you as a student to speak. And right to Mario's left was standing John Leggett, who was a sociology professor, he said, well, I'm a faculty member. Can I speak at the meeting? He said, no, it's a structured meeting. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, Mario told the story right after the FSM to an appreciative crowd at Queens College in New York. And he was saying it, it was, it was very much kind of in a, in a humorous vein about how, how Scott Calpino kept saying it was a structured meeting. And Mario said, by that point, we got the idea that it was a structured meeting. So, so anyway, they're up at the Greek theater. They're having this meeting. And Mario was positioning himself along with Bettina Apthecker and several others close to the stage. And he says to Bettina and Tom Miller, right, before, right when the speech is going on, I'm going to speak at this meeting. And, uh, and there's a little bit of surprise, well, how are we going to do that? And so right at the, um, right, right on the spot, Mario and Bettina and Tom Miller and several others are strategizing, how am I going to get to speak at this meeting? Now, again, I'm, I'm going beyond just the incident itself. Think about what this says. The students are demanding to have a voice. The administration is trying to plan an event that keeps them from having a voice. And that, to me, really defines what, was, what the free speech movement was all about. And the, the net result was that they decided, first, Mario thought, I'll run up there after they finish the meeting. It's like almost a football thing. I'm going to run up there, and you can interference, and I'll get to the microphone. After, after all the speeches in there. In other words, we aren't going to interfere, by the way, not disrupting the meeting in the sense of not preventing anybody else from speaking. You know, this is a free speech movement. And, uh, and then Bettina said, and by the way, this is interesting. Bettina, who was a communist and was always seen as ultra-militant ultra in the press, was actually usually a voice of moderation when it came to tactics. And she was very smart. And she said, no, that will look bad if you rush the stage. You should walk up there very slowly and deliberately, and people will want to have you speak. And so Mario, as, after, uh, after the uh, speeches were given, and by the way, he referred to Clark Kerr's speeches, half, half and half platitudes and fabrication. Um, he walks up to the stage, and, and uh, as he's going up there, um, uh, he's about to get to the podium. And uh, he's wearing a tie. This is 1964. The police grab him and carry him away by his tie onto the side, right? Yeah, it's right there. Yeah. And you don't see the next picture is him being dragged away by his tie. And the uh, pandemonium really break, breaks loose. And by the way, at the FSM victory party a few days later, on Mario's birthday, they presented him with a, a uh, one of those clip-on ties. <laughs> <laughs> but the. Uh, the Okay, thank, right. you, thank you. Okay, thank you for that, that addition. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Laura. Um, so in any case, the uh, way this, what, what that happened, I mean, you could not, a screenwriter could not possibly write something right. more amazing, right in front of your eyes. And, and Clark Kerr's uh, memoir describes this as an accident that looked like fascism. <laughs> That's how, that's how he 
fascism. Yeah, that's his uh, reaction. That's his. So the 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 the, the main thing here is that I think that uh, what this shows is the way that the um, uh, participation uh, participation uh, sorry, participation sorry was thought about differently. The students were insisting on a voice, and the administration was trying to act pretty much unilaterally, or at least with the department chairs. So that's one piece. The idea that students should, and by the way, because of that, uh, that conflict, it really discredited the administration. And this is on December 7th. The next day, the Academic Senate voted to uh, to back the, uh, overwhelmingly, like seven to one, to back the, uh, the December 8th resolutions that gave the, the, gave the student demand for freedom of speech. Uh, uh, no, no university restricted political advocacy. It's historic victory. Um, I'm almost out of time, but let me just hit on a few other very, this points very, very briefly. Um, I see a kind of, um, uh, another aspect of this has to, of, of the, of the um, free speech movement that has resonance today uh, concerns a kind of mistrust of the administration. There was a feeling that the university had buckled under to pressure from business interests and others, conservative legislators, because of yeah, <laughs> because of uh, pressure uh, from the, the civil rights protests to shut down free speech on campus, and there was a feeling that the university should be about the free exchange of ideas. And what is wrong with our leadership that they're not doing that? And that same uh, feeling is here today. I mean, at least among uh, some of the vocal critics of the administration here. I'm not going to judge what's valid or not. I'm, I'm, 3,000 miles away, but I just note that you feel some of that same uh, same um, uh, skepticism uh, today about preserving free education as you did preserving free speech. In fact, last uh, last night's event I was handed this uh, postcard of President uh, Udot saying, "Being president of the University of California is like being manager of a cemetery. There are many people onto you, and no one is listening." <laughs> but, but, but the next line that's not on there which is, you know, makes it more complicated, is I listen to them. So I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is there's a kind of, of, of a, a gap there of mistrust and skepticism that we haven't lost. You know, and I think that it, it suggests that some of these problems with hierarchy and communication and trust in the university that were endemic to the era of the free speech movement have, have not disappeared. Um, the uh, the uh, last Last piece I want to raise, um, which is an ongoing issue, uh, has to do with the critique, of, the critique of undergraduate education that Mario and the free speech movement began to articulate after a while. There was a feeling that the university was, uh, uh, you know, did some things very, very well. And in fact, uh, Clark Kerr in his really very, very, I think it's a classic work, The Uses of the University, described the way that the university served multiple constituencies. In fact, they called it the multiversity, because it served the alumni, it served research, it served uh, uh, a, a whole bunch of uh, constituencies, including undergraduates. But Mario felt that this multiversity, this vision of multiversity, was so, um, uh, so, was taking the university away from its responsibility to its students. And he felt that, in a way, the university was becoming narrowly vocational, and he was concerned that the university was becoming a, 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 like a technical school that was a breeding ground for conformity. And let me just read you from the first sit-in, uh, a quote from Mario talking about this. He said that students go into the university on one side as a kind of rough cut adolescence, and they come out the other side pretty smooth. When they enter the university, they're dependent upon their parents. Now they're dependent upon the university, their product, and they prepare to leave the university to go out and become members of other organizations, various businesses, usually which they often dependent on in the same way. And never, at any point, is provision made for their taking their place as free men. So it's an idea that, you know, that it's too narrow. It's like a assembly line for conformity. And the feeling was that we need to, to push beyond that. And this led, and Clark Kerr himself admitted this, it led to a lot of new thinking about how does a research university do with undergraduate education are really thinking about seriously enough. And in turn led to lots of educational reform, including the work that Charles Muscatine did and is still doing on educational reform, to, to see if we could do a better job of really rethinking undergraduate education. So from my perspective, it's this, is that in a lot of ways, what the free speech movement Mario raised 
was not simply the issue of freedom of speech, but what is a university about? What is a university education for? Who is the university supposed to serve? And also, I would say this, because uh, this is kind of irony in this, that back in the 60s, actually a lot of people doing history of student, of student protest, they called it firefighter research. You know, how do you put out the fire? Everybody was interested in student protest. But these days, the research goes in the opposite direction. There's all this work about civic engagement. Why don't students care? Why aren't students engaged? Why aren't people voting? You know, all, this, all this concern about a lack of, of activism and concern. And so, in a way, the challenge of the, of, I think Mario's legacy sort of challenges us to think about how we can actually have a community in which we encourage people not only to be specialists in certain areas, but to care about the broader good. And actually, it's, it's an irony that it usually seems to take a crisis to get people from one discipline to talk to others, other part of the university. And the same thing with students, that, you know, that one thing that Mario really cherished about the free speech movement was a sense of community, that people actually had time to talk to each other, slow down, not be racing through a bunch of exams and just uh, racing through lots of the curriculum, but really sort of reflect on what really mattered. And I think that kind of, that sense of community, this sort of seriousness of purpose, thinking about why are we here, what's our responsibility in terms of education, how do we serve our society best, what should the university be doing to make the country and the world better? Those are issues that remain with us. And, and part of that, too, is what's the relationship between, between the university and the business community? Should, who should control the research agenda of the university? These are issues that are still with us. Sometimes people talk about it in terms of corporatization. So I, what I'm saying is, from my perspective, even though this is a history book and it really is informed by historical knowledge and, uh, and, 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 and uh, concern with the past, it and Mario, I think, really still speak to us today. So thank you. Thank you. Besides Mar Mario and uh, Jack Weinberg and Tina Eppecker, there weren't many other key activists in the movie. And I'd just like to mention Michael Rossman, who was a very key person. But but along with Michael, along, along with Michael, oh. I'm sorry. sorry, along with Michael uh, and Lynn, others organized many uh, anniversaries uh, over the movement. And uh, all the, the, a lot of the, the, uh, the participants shared their stories and experiences and helped educate us and keep the spirit going. And I want to thank Lynn and everybody else for that. But just, to, just, just it's not a question more or less, but you might want to respond to this. I just feel this was such a profound movement, such an incredible movement. And the people involved kept being activists throughout their lives. And I think it's a great model to save nature and the human race. And I think that's the most important battle we have right now. Uh, any questions? Uh, um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, thank you.